Let's open God's Word once more together. We turn to 2 Peter. I would have liked to have read the whole letter, but uh, I'll leave that to you for a, a Sunday 15 minute exercise, 10 minutes. It's about all it will take. When you get home, grab a cuppa after lunch and sit down and read the letter. There is such blessing as well as warning in this letter. We turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, and as I indicated earlier to the young people, we're looking particularly this morning at verse 18. It's the last verse, but everything that precedes it fills it with purpose and power and urgency. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. This is the word of God. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that existed, that then existed, was deluged with water and perished. <coughs> Excuse me. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord... One day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him, without spot or blemish, and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. 
Let us pray. O oh, Father, may these words that we have read not dissipate from our minds too quickly or at all. But rather, may our minds be captured by your words, our affections stimulated by your truth, our wills directed, submitting to its authority. So grant us the ministry of the Spirit to that end, that as preacher and people, we may humbly receive from you the blessings intended for us this day. In Jesus' name, Amen. A Christian by very definition is one who has received new life in Christ, which we have, of course, through faith in him. New life has begun. Here is a new creature. And this not because of anything we have done, but because of Jesus. Because of what God, by grace through the Lord Jesus, has done in us. To become a Christian is to begin not just life anew, but to begin a new life. To begin a new life. Or to put it bluntly, a born-again Christian who shows no signs of life or growth is at best a contradiction of terms. At worst, an impossible anomaly doesn't really exist. Peter, in his second letter, has spoken of how God has revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how this, through faith in him, brings joy and peace and he wants to stir up the remembrance of this in the people. He knows that they have been and will be going through difficult times because of their faith and love and service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is emphasising as in his first letter, that we have been given all that we need to live a godly life through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the word that reveals him and his purposes to us. But he would not have us live naively through life. And so he also warns of our adversary. And the way that our adversary works, not only in the world against us, but within the church through false teachers, deceivers, those who would confuse and confound and remove the stability of the faith of God's true children. Yet he does not want them to be intimidated into retreat, to isolation, to silence before the world and before one another within the church. He sets before us the reality of our hope in Christ Jesus, who indeed will come again, who will usher in final judgment, who will welcome and gather to himself those who are truly his people. He does not want them to retreat from life but to live life in that hope and the joy and stability that that ought to give us, that our God is sovereign in grace, in mercy, in love, in purpose and in fruit and above all, in time. So rest, be patient, but be active. Live, says Peter. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. His concern, a truth that he wants to have deeply entrenched and etched into their soul and on their minds, is that we must live out our life in Christ for Christ. That having benefited from his glory, 
that we would reveal his glory and others would see of his glory. That we would delight in the life that we have and we would desire for that life to grow. And that should surely be not only Peter's concern, but our concern as a church, as individuals, in the circumstances in which we find ourselves from day to day. Here is our marching orders. As God arises on the new day, in the next stage or phase of our journey. As the ascended victorious king, we can live and we anticipate to grow in the midst of that life to his glory. As we think about that, there are several things I want to draw particularly to your attention this morning. The first one is that it is a natural growth. Peter is not expecting us. The word of God is not calling us to something that is impossible for us, that is abnormal to us. No, it is natural. The simple reality is that life assumes growth. It contains within it the possibility of growth and should lead to growth. That explains why when we plant a seedling in the ground, we come back again and again to see if it's still growing. And if it's not growing, we begin to wonder why. Is there something wrong in the soil? Have I been given too much water, not enough water? Do I need to change the pH level of the soil? Do I need... And we ask those sorts of questions because we expect it to grow. It has life within it And the evidence of that life is that that life will work out into further life's development. And we do the same with our children. We begin to think something is wrong if our children are not growing. Is it their diet? Is there something wrong with them physically? Is there something in the environment? Something that's poisoning them? And what Peter is doing here is is applying that same principle to the spiritual life. Where a true work of grace has taken place, Peter says he has every right, as do you and I, to expect growth in that grace. Where there is a true knowledge of Christ, you have every right to expect growth in that knowledge of Christ. But grow, he says. There are many forces that come against you, but our resolve must be to grow. And it's a natural thing to do, says Peter. A natural thing to do. In 1 Peter chapter 2, He wrote about appreciating the word of God as a newborn baby appreciates his or hers mother's milk. But it was never Peter's intent that you would stay as a baby. You would continue to appreciate as a newborn, but you will grow to maturity. The author to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6 bemoans the fact that they should have been teachers of the gospel. But instead, they still needed to be taught. They were stunted. They had not really grown. Something was wrong. And that's why the letter was written. Their thinking had gone askew. Their affections were in the wrong place. They were on ritual, not upon Christ. The Christian life, in other words, where true is not static. We are to grow. None of us who are Christians have in this life grown enough. Your body may say, 
I've lived enough. But grace says, no, you haven't. There's another day of growth that God has given you today. Another Lord's Day to be fed and nurtured. Growth is going on. Going on. And we will continue to grow after Christ. For all that you know, there is much more to know. For all that you have become through Christ, there is much more change to occur in you. More beauty and splendour to be displayed because of you, as well as in you, to the glory of Christ. Much more to do, more equipping, more strengthening to be able to do it. And this is true no matter how many sermons you've heard, how many times you've read the Bible, how many Christian conversations that have been meaningful to you or to others because of you. Peter still says, but grow, grow. And our question should be each morning, Lord, how do you want me to grow today? Where do I need to develop in my Christian faith, love, ministry? What will you bring to me today? How will this help me to grow? Because our expectation is to grow in Christ. It is the natural thing. We are to grow and keep on growing. And we need to emphasise that because there are far too many Christians running around who think that growth is an instantaneous thing. It's slow. It's progressive. God is developing spiritual muscle and strength and stamina and ability and understanding day after day. Christian maturity is not a one-step action. We are to grow and keep on growing. Secondly, it's a specific growth. If you look around us and look at the trees, surely even an untrained observer can tell that the trees are different. And that different trees grow in a different way than other trees that are different to them. So some trees put all their energy into a trunk that goes up. Some put all their energy into branches from the base over the span of the tree and cause it to bulk out really down low and around. Different trees have a different growth pattern that is natural to that tree. The inner nature of the tree will determine the growth of the tree. It will grow, but the nature of the tree will determine the nature of the growth. That's the principle Jesus used, of course, in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, when he says a bad tree will produce bad fruit. Out of the heart produces, comes all the issues of life. You will reflect the nature in your growth. You will reflect the nature of what you are within. It's how we need to apply that spiritually. In Christian life, we expect, in other words, to grow to type. And Peter here lists two elements of that type. Growth to type for us. Grow in grace. Grow in knowledge. Grow in grace, grow in knowledge. Firstly, we are saved by grace. We all know that here. But do we know that we also grow by grace? By grace. By God at work, God the Holy Spirit at work in us and with us. Grace is the predominant reality of the Christian faith and life. It's beginning, but also it's development, day after day. You live by grace, but you also live in the realm of grace. And we are to grow into that life in which you have been bought, brought by Christ. Daily looking to God for grace upon grace. Renew your grace unto me, Father. Help me to see it afresh. 
Help me to know its help. Don't live in your own strength. The Christian life is one in which you are active, but it's not the result of human strength, but of divine grace. Secondly, we are saved by a knowledge of Jesus Christ and so we shall grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ. Grow in your understanding, in other words, of who Jesus is. Every Christian is a theologian, is the title of a book. How apt that is. But equally, we could write a title, every Christian is a theologian lecturer. We teach, we grow, we are the people of the book, we are people of doctrine, of truth. We grapple with it, we wrestle with it, we seek to apply it. We need to grow in our knowledge of the faith that has been committed once for all to the church and to the world through the church. But I don't think Peter's limited just to the fact that we should grow by reading our Bibles and thinking through what it is saying and and sitting under the word and gathering together in churches and demanding that our pastors and elders use the scriptures to strengthen our faith and to direct our lives. No, it's more than that. We are also to grow in our experimental knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to know him better. Not just truth, but he who is the truth. How does this connect to Christ? How does this draw me to Christ? Bind me to Christ? Cause me to look to Christ? To rest in Christ? To love Christ? To love others because of Christ? And for Christ? Grow in our knowledge of Christ personally, not just principally. This was Paul's great ambition when he said that I might know him. It's great what we know about Christ and we need to grow in that knowledge, yes. Who of us has really wrestled with the Nicene Creed about the glory of Christ? We need to grow in our knowledge. What does the Bible teach us about Christ? But we also need to grow in our knowledge of him. What it is that he so loves you, loves me, so concerned for us. Now this is important for many people rest in adding all sorts of things to their life that we would expect to find in Christian circles. Find Christians doing religious activities, good works. You can find yourself growing in all these things year after year, getting yourself busier and busier and busier. But that is not what we're talking about here. Indeed, it's very deceptive. Think of it this way. I can have a pile, of, maybe you had a problem with your children when they were growing up as teenagers, a pile of clothes in the middle of their bedroom. And every day that pile seemed to be growing. None of it ended up in the laundry. None of it ended up being put away. It was worn and then put on the pile until the drawers and the cupboards were empty of clothes. And I've got nothing to wear. That pile of clothes of a child is growing and growing. But has it grown? That dust that is lying on the shelf that seems to grow more and more as each week goes by and you notice it. But is it a living thing? Is it a growing thing? There is a sign of growth more and more. There's no life that is there. I wonder for all your Christian involvement over the years, do you know that you have not grown? Do you suspect that it's just been activity, not growth in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
And life will manifest itself in various practical ways. Don't get me wrong. You'll find yourself busy in ways that you think are so contrary to your personality because God is at work in you. But religious activities is not a sign in and of itself that you are growing. It is not the means of growth in that sense. The answer is not more religious activity, but Jesus, who is the life, who came to give life and to give it abundantly. Adding morality, religious activity to one's life is not the same thing as growing. You may put on the garment, but actually becoming weaker under its weight. Because you're not being drawn to Christ. You're not growing according to type. We should be asking ourselves questions. Can I say that I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus? As I look back over the time that I've been in the Christian life, am I aware of such development in me? When was the last time you did a life check like that? A spiritual life check. Thirdly, I want us to talk about the fact that it is a committed growth. Clearly, we have a command to grow and the direction in which we are to grow. But both of these realities demand commitment on our part. We're not to be passive, Peter says, but grow. He doesn't say, just lay back and let it happen. Let go and let God. No, that's not in the scriptures. It's a deception. Peter says, grow. Okay, Peter, what does it demand of me to grow? What do I have to do to grow according to type? If I have this new nature, how can I encourage its development? Well, how do you grow physically? We all know that we cannot force ourselves or others to grow. So we go about it by doing the things that are helpful to growth. So we make sure our children get fresh air, get exercise, have good food appropriate clothing or in safe environments and yet at the same time are tested in in more difficult seasons so that they get a bit of resilience and get a bit stronger in different ways, negative and positive. We do all those sorts of things, don't we? Well, let's apply that spiritually. The parallels in the spiritual realm are not hard to identify. We give attention to the food for our soul. As we've now already known, Peter said in his first letter about the milk of the word, the sincere, that is the unadulterated, the uncompromised, the uncontaminated milk of the word, the pure milk of the word. That says Peter is an instrumental cause of growth, that you may grow thereby. You cannot expect to grow as a Christian if you don't study the word of God. If you don't read it regularly, if it's not a controlling aspect of your diet, if I don't feed on this book, I simply will not grow. So when Peter says, but grow, he is basically saying, now start back where I first started. Read it again. That's why I gave you that homework. Read Second Peter. And if that gets your appetite, go back even further. Read First Peter. It's only five chapters. It's not going to take long. Read the word of God. <coughs> Those who do not grow in grace or give only mar- find only marginal growth are inevitably people who give less, little attention to the word of God. Those who are weak in the face of temptation are people who inevitably give little attention to the word of God, directing and controlling their affections, their desires, and the directives of their will. Food for your soul. Do you have good food? Do you have good uptake of food? Are you digesting your food? Secondly, the air for our soul, which is prayer. Are we often in the presence of God? In prayer. In the word he speaks to us. In prayer. 
we speak to God. That's a wonderful reality. And if you're anything like me, you struggle in both of these areas. And so you know, like me, that we need to grow. We need to make these priorities in our lives. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, In prayer one not only comes into communion, communication with God, one receives the life of God. And he's right. Have we not known this? Have we not come to God because we've been burdened in some way and in the midst of our tears and our pleas, we have been strengthened, we've been calmed, we've been encouraged. We may not have received an answer that we had hoped for or a direction with a clarity, but we've known the communion with God and his gracious influence that has been in our lives. We underestimate prayer and its place as a means of growth. Think of the Psalms. How many of them start with an unfolding of the burden but end with encouragement, with a vision of hope, with a determination renewed to live to the glory of God. New energy, more praise. Thirdly, the exercise of your soul. That is, engage in fellowship and in witness. They stimulate growth by by challenging us, challenging our understanding of the Bible. There's nothing like talking to another Christian who's going through problems for you to have to get some spiritual muscle yourself to help them bear their burden. You are strengthened, you are sharpened by their problems, but equally by their joys as you fellowship with them. They lift you up, they encourage you through the application of the word of God into each other's life. And isn't it the same with with our witness? You know, to talk to someone about Jesus, they're going to throw a curly at you, you've never thought about that. And we're usually intimidated by that. We should just say, wow, that is really a good question. I'm not sure how to answer that. Let me come back to you. And come back. Get into the word. Talk to other Christians. What do I say? What could I say? Don't, you know, assume that you should know everything. Don't let them assume you know everything. But you're growing. And you will grow as you engage with non-Christians. Try to bring a Christian perspective as they evidence the morality that they want to embrace for today in their lives, which may be different tomorrow. So you're always going to be bouncing off what's going on in the world around them and in them. (coughs) And that will have an impact as it will drive you to study, drive you to prayer, drive you to think, drive you to God. Looking for help. And in that, finding strength and encouragement. But don't forget also the importance of rest. (coughs) We know that for our own physical growth that we need to rest. I remember being told as a student in university years the importance of maintaining eight hours rest. You've got to sleep. I know the professors assume that you're only going to sleep for two hours. But you've got to get the eight, otherwise you can't run the course. Your mind won't be sharp. You won't take in. You won't hold fast the things that you learn. You need rest. But we need rest for our soul as well. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, verse 4, Peter calls us to come to Christ. We must not only know more of Christ, we must engage with Christ. Yes, but further, we must rest in Christ. We have to rest in his saving grace. We have to rest in his promises. We have to rest our mind. How many times do we spend hours in our sleep or what we hope would be sleep or in through the days wrestling because we're wondering what on earth God is or is not doing? Why hasn't he? Why does he? 
Oh God, where are you? Oh God, why? And we read in the Psalms that he allows us to ask those questions. But when they're asked, there reaches a point where we rest and we trust God. We need to trust God in our lives and with our lives. To cultivate that rest of faith that says, I don't know why God did this or that, but I believe that God is, that God works, and that he sovereignly and always works with good purpose. And in the end, that's enough. And so I move on. I'm encouraged, strengthened. That's why it's important to... to to place and keep yourself in a church where the word of God is taught, believed and practised. Because we will not grow unless these are the directions that are emphasised into our lives. But equally, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 calls us to avoid all those things which are poisonous and exercise a destructive tendency to our growth. <coughs> Laying aside all malice, he says, all deceit, hypocrisy, and all evil speaking. And that's what he does here in the second chapter, as he talks about, uh, in Second Peter chapter 2, talks about all the tendencies, the pressures that are brought to bear against us, particularly by false teachers. And those who say that Christ is not on the throne. Don't get caught up in the things or teachings contrary to the word, but grow in the grace and knowledge. Cultivate those things that are important for spiritual development. Avoid those things that work against it. And lastly, we'll talk about it being a beneficial growth. Peter starts here with that little word, but... In other words, that what he is saying in these last verses, last sentences, stands in opposition to what has gone before. There's this tendency to bear down upon you, to crush you, to stifle you, to, to, to make you less stable in your faith, less energetic in the service of Christ. But instead, our response is to grow. Develop resilience. Grow. Seek grace. Draw near to Christ and you'll find that you can withstand that opposition. But more than that, that it will strengthen you. It will strengthen you. The more you grow, the stronger you will be. The more discerning you will become. The more committed to Christ you will be. Peter saw Christians in his day being attracted away from Christ and the life of godliness and what some have called a sideshow Christianity, one that is full of novelties, fads, trends, and easy promises. As Dick Lucas writes, every day represents a fresh challenge when we will be tempted to forget everything we have learned over the years and to trade it in for a novelty item. Peter says the only antidote is Jesus. Grow in the grace of Jesus. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus. Grow to the glory of Jesus. And that was the greatest need of the church in the apostolic day. I think it's a greater need in the post-apostolic day in which we live, the post-modern day in which we live. To grow in Christ and for Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your purpose that we grow up into Christ as well as be born again in Christ. We want our lives to matter. We're so thankful for what you have done. 
We want to bring glory to you and to the Lord Jesus. We want to see others see the, 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 the blessings of Christ. Help us to grow in Christ. Help us to grow true to the type of grace. Help us to grow in likeness to Christ and to evidence that in living lives of true godliness. Protect us as a congregation from those things that would work against that growth. Help us to be alert and watchful of our adversary and all the subtleties that he uses to distract us, to weaken us, to destabilise us, to disrupt us. May we grow together as one in Christ and for Christ. Hear our prayers for the church to that end. In Jesus' name, Amen.